Good evening, and welcome to Poetry at the Dali. We're appreciative of the support of the city of St. Petersburg for part of this program, and we're most appreciative of you coming tonight and uh, um, mindful of the joy of being together as a community uh, under a roof for the first time for a long, long time. Uh, we were very happy to learn uh, how successful our program could be when it was uh, delivered on Zoom. Um, but as you know, the fellowship of person to person uh, can't find a substitute. So we're going to, uh, this year in our program, uh, we're going to have both live in-person readings and also a Zoom program. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, this program is curated by Helen Pruitt Wallace, who is uh, not only a member of the Board of Trustees of the Dolly Museum uh, and uh, an excellent, excellent uh, curator of poetry, editor of poetry, but uh, she is Poet Laureate of St. Petersburg. And uh, I think that we will be joined presently by Peter Monkey the Poet Laureate himself of Florida. And the gentleman with him is not a Poet Laureate at all, but he is useful in escorting Poet Laureates uh, about, both at home and here at the Dali. Peter, good to see you. Welcome, welcome. Uh, it is our tradition uh, to ask Helen to begin the reading program with a poem of her own. And uh, sometimes she says, can I be excused this time? The answer is no, no. But we, we require that and we're overjoyed to have it. Helen, please come forward. Hi, everybody. So nice to, to be back here with you. Thank you for, for coming out. Gosh, it's been two years since we've been in this room, right? Um, so it, it is a delight to, to see you all. And, um, you know, I was thinking about how I think for many of us, when we first start venturing out, we feel a little awkward. I mean, it's kind of hard to get back into the rhythms of what we had pre-pandemic for some of us, I think. And, um, but I think poetry is a way um, and kind of a unique way to bring people back together and because it puts us so much in the present. Um, when you're reading poetry, when you're writing poetry, when you're listening to poetry, um, I think you are kind of put into the present moment, ideally. And, um, and I think it does help with some of that, I don't know, destabilized feeling of, okay, what next? You know. So um, we have a terrific program tonight to very Good poets, Emily Schulten and Heather Sellers, we're so happy to have you guys with us. And thanks, as always, um, to Hank for his support um, of this program. And thank you also to the staff who worked so hard to help us make this happen. Joy Garrett Douglas, Dr. Kim McQuarrie, and also John Fisher in the back, our techs are. So um, we appreciate it from you guys. And thank you to the city of St. Pete for supporting this program, going on seven years now. Um, so I will read a poem. Um, this poem is a relatively new one that I wrote about um, a place in North Carolina where my husband, Peter, in the back here, um, and I like to go hiking a lot. And um, one spring when I was up there hiking, I uh, there's a, a cabin way back in the woods that's a very old cabin. Um, the oldest in the Smokies, that part of the Smokies, and it's called Ferguson's Cabin. And I wandered in, and there was a bird um, in the cabin, and couldn't figure out how it had gotten in because all the windows were closed and the door was closed. Um, so this poem is, um, that was the trigger for this poem. Um, and then it goes in some different places. I think the only thing you need to know is that it, where we go in North Carolina, the hemlocks are having a problem with a um, insect called a woolly adelgid and it's a kind of aphid, and when they suck the sap out of the, um, the twigs, it turns a kind of crusty white, um, kind of cottony 
look. So that's an image in this poem. And also you'll hear reference to my favorite bird. It's a viri. It has just an incredible sound. If you don't know that sound, it's really haunting and beautiful. So um, that's in this poem too. This is called Wren Trapped in Ferguson's Cabin. I found her in that old abandoned place, deep in the mountain woods, beating against rafters, panes, every impossible corner. She wouldn't let me catch her, wouldn't stay still, but her feathers brushed once against my skin as she ricocheted ceiling to sill, then huddled beneath the desk to catch her breath. That was years ago. I could do little. I propped the door wide open with a rock. But maybe this isn't about the bird. There are worse things than death, the dead remind us. I said a prayer or something like a prayer and left. Outside, sun hit the hemlocks, swab, swabs twigging the limbs, adelgids leave bandaged every spring, needles sucked dry of sap. Who says what's done can't be undone? Nesting viries sing their secret code that spirals like a battle cry through mist. Such defiance in those spare, brittle branches, goading me, get up. You can go anywhere. Thank you. Now we have the delight to listen to Emily Shulton. Emily is the author of The Way a Wound Becomes a Scar, I love that title, um, by Kelsey Books, um, and Rest in Black Hall by New Plains Poetry. Her poetry and nonfiction appear widely in national journals such as Plowshares, Prairie Schooner, Colorado Review, and Tin House, um, among others. Currently, she's professor of English and creative writing at the College of the Florida Keys. Please welcome Emily Shelton. Good evening. Um, thank you first to, to Helen and all at the Dolly for having me. Uh, and uh, what a pleasure to be here to read um, and to hear poems from, uh, from Helen and from Heather. So thank you all. Uh, I'm going to start tonight by reading a couple poems that are poems appropriate to this place, I think. Um, so a, a couple, um, one of them is, is a Florida poem, and one of them is um, a sort of Dali poem. So uh, I'm going to start with that one. Uh, in, this, uh, in this new collection, The Way in a Wound Becomes a Scar, um, I have a couple. It's mostly about um, a kidney transplant. Uh, for which I was the donor. Uh, but this poem is not about that at all. There will be some of that uh, that I will read, but um, this one is called North of Barcelona. Somewhere north of Barcelona, I realize I've been talking to your absence. Since the last morning we woke together, I've been telling the starched white sheet I wake on about the place where the road bends on the night walk back to my room, where a restaurant appears, dim and acoustic, the Moroccan scarves and nagchampa pursuing me from storefronts, and postcards failing to reflect the water in front of them. I tell you the stairs to my hotel make me breathless. I got lost the first day, and couldn't make enough words to ask how not to be lost anymore. How after a western walk from the bus stop, meandering through the fishing village, stammering for what was left of the Spanish on my tongue, the view was my redemption for a curved bus ride up mountains, for arriving sallow and for the jeans that squeeze my thighs in a paste of sweat. I tell you that the sea is lacquered sky. I visit Salvador Dali's house, and I want to move there with you. We will catch white fish and cover it in salt, eat it with Spanish red wine. 
We will sleep under sketched surreal angels, painted coasts, clocks, and branches. People will come see us. We won't have to leave. Every night before I fall asleep in Caracas, I tell empty space next to me about my day and how I don't know where home is. Thank you. Um, this poem's a little closer to home, wherever that is. Um, this poem is probably, this is something I usually explain when I read the poem, although this might be some um, a bit more common knowledge here. Uh, but this poem is titled El Lector, which is the, uh, the person in the cigar rolling factories who would stand on a podium and, and read to the cigar rollers uh, while they worked. El Lector. Your father tells lies about how it began. Your father tells it that he was a lector. He walked the aisles of immigrants, their hands browned and fists sore, to stand above them on La Tribuna in the smoke, revered. He read Cervantes, emphatic with gesture. His Castilian brought life to La Voz de la Suicidad. Yours is certain this isn't the truth as your father's certain it is. In your version, your great-grandfather comes from Cuba and he is merely one of those cigar rollers. But narrative is all that's left. So much of where you were born only exists in folktale. The pattern of barreling down to build more and higher has made a mass-produced tropic of your birthplace and exiled to memory all that is native. Your legacy, an oral lore, a telephone game mythology. The only truth you know is that you are confined to these, this island, set in the coral stone of your birth. The past only foretells when read backward. So I listen to you tell me your story in circles, a curse our children will inherit their chronicle a catacomb that can't be unearthed. So I think I might end with another um, uh, regional poem, but, but for now I'm going to turn to some of the poems from The Way a Wound Becomes a Scar. Uh, this first one is um, called Dialysis. So um, in 2000 and 11, um, my brother had a kidney transplant. He was actually, um, it's a hereditary uh, disease that he had that's impossible to pronounce uh, and, and causes the kidneys to fail. Mm. But he was the first one in our family to have it. He's actually patient zero. Um, and uh, both of his daughters did, uh, and, and here, I was going to say catch. They did, uh, they, they both have the disease, his um, oldest daughter recently had a transplant too. Uh, all of these successful so far, so this is great. Um, uh, but my sister-in-law recently at Christmas time this year, uh, last year, gave her kidney to uh, my niece. So uh, it's, uh, this, is, this book is sort of focused on mostly that process. Dialysis. Before I gave my brother my kidney, they pierced a hole in the middle of his body, inserted a tube, and left it there. His wife's yellow mixing bowl rested between his knees, filling with his vomit until I emptied and rinsed it. Because at first, all the fluid funneled into his stomach made him sick. Four times a day, the tube attached to the bag took all his poison. His two little blonde girls weren't phased by the jugs of urine in the fridge, the vials in the butter dish, when they came in from playing and opened the door for apple juice. For them, this was life, their father's blood being cleaned. For us, at their age, it was easy, standing back to back, our arms hooked at the elbows, taking turns, him leaning forward, 
holding my weight until he couldn't, and I stood up and lifted him. So I've chosen a few um, poems from this book to read tonight that uh, have a, a common thread of uh, reference to uh, Egyptian myth. So um, it's, it's mostly pretty clear. None of it uh, needs to be explained too much. But just so uh, if you catch it, there it is. Um, this next one um, is one of those. It's called The Myth of the Ib. When I told you they would cut my kidney out, we made jokes of it, neither of us saying what both of us thought, that if only we could live without the heart instead, or could take the hearts of the dead and make those work inside of us. Because we'd made such shit of ours and were ashamed. You reminded me that sea stars can grow new arms when one is lost. Egyptian myth tells us the heart is made from a single drop of mother's blood during conception. You told me it would be okay, laughed about dying, and we agreed the blood in our hearts had been tainted, that we'd have to live broken, we'd never be starfish. Before they scalpeled the kidney out, I searched a scan on a lit wall in the hospital room the organ glowing in its torso, an electric yellow donor body, perfectly lopsided. Uh, these next two poems I'm going to read are uh, both uh, titled Navigating the Afterlife with the subtitles. Uh, the first one is uh, Book of the Dead, which is the Egyptian funerary text. Um, and then the next one is uh, Burial Goods, which are just like what they sound like, uh, those items that were buried with um, the Egyptians when they died. Navigating the Afterlife, Book of the Dead. Carved into the walls of your home are spells, last ditch efforts to bring you back when your body fails or they fail to find a donor. You learned about these coffin texts from your father when you were 21, a balding, heavyset funeral director, having trained himself over the years never to smile, gave you lined paper and asked you to write a letter to your dad to send into the ground with him. You chose words so carefully, using only images you thought would entice him back no God was off limits, no plea went too far. And now you look into a mirror and try to conjure him to find features that replicate his, the bridge of your nose, the way your lobes hang, the width of your forehead. You plan the path taking you to another side where you know you can be found. You recite the walls, put your spells in order. Navigating the afterlife, burial goods. You find yourself making a list of goods late at night when the kids have fallen asleep and your wife is making tomorrow's lunches. When no one is home, you scan for what you will need. You steal items from your house and hoard them beneath some loosened closet floorboards. Your grandfather's hammer a gold necklace from beneath your wife's sink, some charcoal, a stone pot, non-perishables. You write a map, a plan for how you will use each item, what you will need to build, and what you will need to barter. One Sunday, you ask your eldest daughter to craft a boat from her dried, pinkened popsicle sticks. You tell her, this is how you'll travel the sky or hellfires, how you'll find a place and begin preparing the dinner that will be waiting for her. Uh, this ne next one is a, um, not so much about the kidney transplant. It's actually a love poem, I think. 
Um, our little death joke. I told you once that when I died, you could sleep with as many women as you like, as long as you would vow to sob post-coitally. <laughs> I told you straight-faced as I made a W with my legs over your torso, pulled the blue duvet around the lump our bodies made. We laughed about it occasionally, our little death joke. The Egyptians believed the heart was where the soul was, slit the bellies of the dead, remove the still organs, but leave the quiet heart between its ribs, wrapping the arms, torso, slick, clammy skin, tight and white. They performed the opening of the mouth ceremony, touched the mummy on the lips, eyes, and ears with a blade so he could speak and sense live again in the hereafter. You wrapped me strip over strip of our linen bed sheets, listened to my voice, provided me with a blade. I plead for you to keep me inside so that when we stopped breathing, our hearts would weigh no more than a feather. And when what remained was only stillness, we could pull open our red centers and watch a sacred ibis unfold itself into flight. This is the last kidney poem I'll read, and then I have a couple more uh, Florida poems. Love poem to my kidney. The kidney is the only organ besides the heart that Egyptians left in the mummified bodies of their dead. After the doctors tucked my kidney into my brother's abdomen, the one remaining inside of me began to grow, to double in size and do the work of two organs, the delicate filtering pipe and reed tune. My brother's body began to cape his new kidney, fibrous tissue like the knotted linen of the Egyptian dead safekeeping in a new life. Now, what's missing isn't evident except for the lightning stretching down from my chest when I lie topless across my bed. Egyptians had no word in their language for kidney, the taste of its syllables so heavy on my tongue. It's actually true when, you, um, when one of your kidneys is taken out, the other one doubles in size to do the work of two. And uh, so I have one giant kidney. <laughs> or my kidney is bigger than yours. <laughs> um, this poem is a villanelle, and it has an epigraph. It's called, We'll All Be Drowned. All at once, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. Lean your ear close to the tide, my dear. Learn the sound of swallowing. The scales bind men's eyes now, afraid to see that one day soon we'll all be drowned. The algae line on the brick rises toward the cannon's mouth. A quiet advance moves unnoticed to take three forts. Lean your ear close to the tide, my dear. Learn the sound of the language your children will know, the muted depth where you will kneel when it's thigh deep, too afraid to see that one day soon we'll all be drowned. Gather where the steeple raises a star to the sky, but don't pray. Picture on its angles where the seagrass will snag and lean your ear close to the tide, my dear. Learn the sound. Prepare now for the fools who thought they'd built heaven to paddle among the fish in the streets, their own floundering, afraid to see that one day soon we'd all be drowned. Watch wood floors buckle, stone gardens grow. Submit to the glass breaking, everything turning blue, 
and lean your ear close to the tide, my dear. Learn the sound and see that one day soon we'll all be drowned. Uplifting uh, weather poem. The last poem I'm going to read for you guys tonight is, uh, well, I hope it's a nostalgic poem. Um, and it is a, a Florida poem, so it's, um, I hope it's also has some images that will resonate with you. Uh, this poem, let's see, I think that it's pretty self-explanatory. It's called, um, uh, well, I will touch on this. I, I think probably in Florida we all, and most of us will recall, uh, and several years back there was a change.org uh, petition to, to get rid of these. Um, those fetal sharks in jars that are, are sold as uh, a little gift when you're on your vacation. Uh, so this is Ode to Fetal Sharks in Jars. Dakin misses the days when they sold the preserved fetal sharks up and down the main drag. As a kid, he gazed for long stretches of time at dozens of upturned faces in blue liquid, not in water, not even close to being something of the body, not even close to being something of the sea. Noses to the sky, without air, frowning. Their wide eyes and undeveloped arms in permanent and suspended surprise, grotesque and plastic. Their solitude was his, too, when fewer people peopled his streets, when space and silence existed, and these tchotchkes dotted the state straight up the panhandle in a line of citrus stand signs, towering oranges eclipsing the sun, and pineapples made of metal and neon, their leaves great enough for osprey to make nests in and to be left alone, mostly. A map for sleepy summer drives and unbearable heat, straight down to the place of his birth, a map he can't travel now, a quiet as hard to put a finger on as nostalgia. Now, everywhere, there is noise, not the sound of sea, not the sound of breeze. Now, everywhere, there is the sound of bodies, never suspended for long, and buildings always building upward to get us all, everyone who can possibly fit, closer to the sunset, the divine and commercial sunset, more brilliantly red and pink by the summer, and it's always summer day. There used to be siestas, and he remembers them. In the afternoon in August, his eyes surveyed the displays of sharks that would always be young and never be swimming. The streets emptied, the storefronts cleared, the men home in hammocks, their chests undressed and bellies bared to the shade of the mango trees and their leaves. And they shook and you could hear them. Thank you all. Thank you, Emily, for the terrific reading. Um, you know, what a beautiful gift to give someone your kidney. Um, and you wrote about it so so well. Um, I want to do a shout out too. Um, Dayton, are you still in here? Emily's husband, that who was she was just talking about in her last poem, um, is here also with their 17-month-old, right? Otis. Um, but they may have just stepped out. So um, they were in the back. I don't think they are though now. Oh, is that okay? <laughs> Anyway, nice that they could, they could come. So thank you for that good reading. Next, we have the pleasure of hearing Heather Sellers. Um, Heather is a Florida native, and she's the author of two new poetry collections, and we are delighted um, to be 
one of her launches for these new books that are um, so terrific, Field Notes from the Flood Zone and the Present State of the Garden, um, as well as two previous collections, The Boys I Borrow and Drinking Girls in Their Dresses. Um, her popular textbook, The Practice of Creative Writing, is in its fourth edition. It's amazing, Heather. Um, following two books on craft, page after page and chapter after chapter. She's written a children's book, Spike and Cubby's Ice Cream Island Adventure, and published numerous chapbooks, a collection of short, linked short stories titled Georgia Underwater, and a memoir, You Don't Look Like Anyone I Know, featured in O, the Oprah Magazine, and an O Book of the Month Club pick. Editor's Choice of the New York Times, her memoir was also featured on NPR, The Today Show, Good Morning America, and The Rachel Ray Show. So um, if you haven't... If you're not familiar with Heather's um, amazing memoir, you might check that out. Um, her recent essays appear in the New York Times, Reader's Digest, Real Simple, Good Housekeeping, The Sun, and O, oh, The Oprah Magazine. Her essay, Haywire, was selected for the Best American Essays by Leslie Jameson, and Pedal, Pedal, Pedal won a Pushcart Prize. She taught for many years at Hope College, where she was the 2011 Hope Professor of the Year, and, to, and currently she's faculty member at the undergraduate and MFA creative writing programs at the University of South Florida, um, where she's been awarded two university-wide awards for teaching and service, one recently, I think, right? So please welcome Heather Sellers. Thank you for coming. Um, this is my first time in a room with people ever. Um, <laughs> it feels like. Um, thank you, Helen. And Emily, it was such a treat to hear your poems. Y'all are going to think we planned our event, and we did not, but there's some a lot of overlap. Also, thank you to Tom Below Books. We have an amazing bookstore in St. Pete. And thank you all for being here on this beautiful Thursday night. So I published this past year two books of what will be three in a Florida trilogy the Present State of the Garden is about life on land and all of the losses here. And Field Notes from the Flood Zone is about life on the water, this water that we have so much a part of our lives here. And I'm currently writing a third book titled Where to Live and How and When and Why. It's a working title. Uh, I'll read poems from each of the three projects tonight, and I most look forward to your questions and our conversation afterwards, and we'll be signing books out front. I'm taking an online class, and the first day we did that thing where you say your name and where you're from. The class is based in New York, and I said, I'm Heather, I'm from Florida. And a man in the class said, Florida, rah, Florida, terrible place, Florida. You've, you've heard this before. <laughs> and it just makes me feel physically harmed when people say that. Always when people say that, people who aren't from here or people who are from here, who barely know this place and they turn up their nose, it feels to me like you're criticizing my mother. <laughs> my complicated, broken, beautiful mother whom you do not know, and unfortunately, it seems like you never really will. So I was born and raised in Florida, nacido y criado, and I grew up in what Rebecca Solnit calls an inside-out childhood. In my family, inside was very dangerous. My home was filled with chaos and sometimes unspeakable violence. But outside, Florida, well, Florida saved me. The place raised me. How lucky to live in a place with armadillos, pink trees that rain blossoms down on your head, purple and gold flowers, uh, gators and the pink birds and the sky and the storms and a thousand kinds of rain, an inside-out childhood. Of course, I became a poet. So I'll read, I'll read eight poems, and then we'll have our conversation. And thank you again so much for coming. So I'll start with childhood, the childhood poems weave throughout the three books. Childhood never really leaves. It's still here. And so those poems keep coming back. And if you're from Florida, 
you know that in every body of water, no matter how small that retention pond, there is an alligator. <laughs> this piece is called Fun for Everyone Involved. As a girl, I lived with my father in a pink duplex on the west side of Orlando. I slept in a brown velour recliner on the jealousy window porch. My father, Fred, slept in a king-size bed that filled the bedroom, and I never went in that room. It was all mattress. We lived on a dirt road, McLeod. Interstate Highway 4 ran along the dirt road, and there was always a cloud of dust over the hot lawn. The drainage ditch got fenced in over Christmas, and come spring, an alligator rose up out of the emerald green muck inside the fence. My father and I named him Lil Fella. Come summer, we renamed him Big Fella. <laughs> I saw my father feed him old chicken, saw him throw bread over the fence around the ditch, a kettle of scorched soup. The gator lived in a cage, in essence. We named him to love him, but it did not feel right to know him that way. My father, standing at the chain link, a tumbler of gin in one hand, his face already off sides, early afternoon, banging on the fence, hollering, want some what, big fella? What do you want? I thought maybe we had it all wrong and not just the story we told ourselves about Big Fella, all of it. For example, that gator could be a girl, could have no name. My father said we'd grill him 4th of July. He said that just to rile me, and it did rile me. My father said I could not ever move out. I slept in a brown velour chair that tilted back, not a bed. I had to move out. Boys who lived one trailer over told me Desmond threw a dog inside that fence. It was true, I could see blood, black now, on the wire. It was awesome, those boys said. Throw you in there, my father loved to say. Can you swim? How fast? Every time he said fast, he reached down and grabbed one of my thighs with both his ice-wet hands and leaned over, bit my shoulder. Chomp, he liked to say. Chomp. Oh, come on now, don't be that way. We're just having fun. Okay. So, people... Um, <laughs> People um, in Florida say of Florida, there's no seasons here. And this just astounds me. I want to say, come, come outside. Come outside. Look around. I'll show you. Uh, my books use the seasons of the year in Florida as an organizing principle, as an ordering principle. And I'm going to start with winter in Florida now and then move through um, the seasons. This poem is titled, Eyes on the water. For weeks, milky webs covered the pond, strands of stillness, binding non-movement, no rain, and winter's highest lows, 85 degrees. But this morning, at dawn, I heard owl language moor along the automated church bells across the street. And when I reached the pond, it was clear, a mirror. So bubbles, I thought, when I first saw the two rounds, water lumps, perfect floating orbs of black water held by twin wet hoods. Then I noticed the shovel shape, long crenulated jaw hovered just under the scrim, the darker thing under dark water. I saw her see me. I fell into this looking at looking, gold crazed irises, living motionlessness, vertical pupils, doorways, 
to even darker rooms. Another breath. I had with me on her leash the elegant, bent, and crucial peach fur pale bone lady Momochan. Thus, I felt more vulnerable than usual, tethered to the dogs not knowing and my own age, some responsibility for us both to live. The dog pulled, wanting higher ground, but I held on. I'm really sorry about that, Teru. I watched for movement, the possible speed of the great gator's gruesome legs and toenails, the coming rips of tears of teeth, maybe the dog's pierced torso, maybe mine, my failing to rescue anything, maybe my failure to even try. My mother's voice, the sign says danger. It's written in red, alligators, snakes, there's even photographs of them. But when I was a girl, I wandered the swamp here boldly. No houses, no signs. I listened to the gators' brays, aligned their hunger with their territory and longing with both affection and loneliness. We were all creatures, no houses, not one house here. Tomorrow, four men with a small crane and a saddle net will come and they'll take her. I will watch the great leather crease dragged from the pond, the muscular crescent from the depths. I'll near feel the jagged curves of her body green in the sun, more immense, more stranded, and more alive than I understood, the eyes of the pond. And that white stuff, winter's toxic gossamer threads, will gather at the pond's edge, a shelf of froths stand, stranded under the bare cypress. Those old skeleton men who stand as creaky forest in a dry circle around the army gray metal transformer strung with illuminated Christmas wreaths and fairy lights, mostly working. Living room. I spent the cold afternoon bringing potted plants inside, covering the garden with bed sheets weighed down by stones. Next door, Frank draped his dead wife's roses, blooming with plastic sheets. We did not speak. I envied his skill and his preparation. When I'd done the best I could, but not really, I drove to the coast across the long causeway, out to the island. My friends invited me into the three sofas living room. And rise, we did, we did, each from our own sofa, reading the long poem, not long at all, simply longer than a single page, translated from Polish, reading aloud, stanza by stanza, taking turns, can the poet make things up? The pleasure of wrangle. Overhead, the ceiling sagged in an old and pleasing way. Palm fronds scratched the windows. A dark thing outside pressing. She looked up a word in the dictionary, and he showed me a green bowl he made, a lopsided cup. I wanted these things. I wanted everything. Covered half in a borrowed blanket, I ran to my car through the wind, its harsh batting. I drove back across waves of blackened water. Floridian frostwork glazed the lawns of Tampa Palms. My dark home, tomb and greenhouse, its skirt of pointed silvers, and I stood outside for a long time, freezing, wholly in love with this world. All right, so the seasons are progressing. This is a love poem to suburban living, and it's also the end of winter, which, as you know, means the end of the dry season, that day. The title is On Belmont Drive. 
On Belmont Drive, my neighbor Ellen comes to the edge of the driveway holding her pink aged micro dog, a limp puff in the crook of her arm. Toodle who, she says, toodle ha. Huh? I want to get on with my walk, but I stop to listen, and I will listen to every word Ellen has to say, and this long hour will be a church service, dull during, but so good after. Human contact, its invisible beauty, might be the meaningfulness I call God. So I bow by the American flag flagging cheerfully over the drought parchmented suburban begonias, their skirts of white pea gravel glittering in a gem way in the evening light. And I mirror Ellen's syllables, who, who, ha, ha, and her laughter, and then her friendly little song, even the jig. Ellen is the only other weird person inside the gates of Tampa Palms besides me. <laughs> Norwegian neighbors, she says now, smiling, are mean. Listening to Ellen is like listening to jazz, not annoying, a little difficult. I don't mind being puzzled. I like keeping up. She likes to say the opposite of the things she means. I like that, too. <laughs> Here come the Norwegian neighbors. They cycle past fast family as kite, waving, not looking, Kelvin, Elvin, Melvin, Calvin, and the dad. <laughs> Ellen hands me the dog. It's a small, warm purse. The eyes, blue milk, so liquid, I worry they'll fall onto the concrete driveway. Our subdivision is sinking, falling into the soup. Sinkhole insurance required, mandatory, impossible to get. See the cracks in our foundations? We are falling apart. But Ellen is worried tonight and every night about this. Who will feed the feral cats? Her front step is lined with aluminum bowls, eight stations now when she dies. I will. I will become the delirious, joyous, wild cat poet of Tampa Palms, <laughs> even though I don't like cats at all or the rats who follow them like businessmen in bold daylight. There are so many cats. Although today, what I first thought was cat was an otter oscillating across the dry, broken backyard grass. And I worry about claws, diseases, and birds, just as my mother did. She squirted any cat, murderer, murderer, when she saw one creeping across our garden, shot him with her hose nozzle set on jet, screaming. Ellen is not a hater. She loves all broken things and their people. I think that's how she's become translucent, floating with her ancient baby dog just above the lawn now, speaking of her dead husband, always in the present tense, Carl, is not good with tools, but he's so funny. She's sorry she's letting the lawn die. Dormant, I say, not dead, dormant, by which I mean everything, mostly us. This is June 2nd, the evening after the opening day of hurricane season. No rain since November. The ponds and swamps crackled and dry and dead. Even the jasmine is dying. Even the cactuses have bent down this year low to the ground. But when it rains at last, the streets will quickly flood to our doorsteps now, well up into our garages, over our pools, into under the sliding glass doors, carpets of water. We knelt just then in unison, Ellen and I, holding the rattling crooked dog between us, creaking our way down together to press our palms on the pavement. We bent down because of the fresh dark speckles on the driveway, raindrops. We saw them, but we had not felt them yet. The dog tilted back as a patient. The sky turned silver as a razor. 
and the raindrops landed on our faces then, and it was like the first rain ever in the world, and the opening sheets of rain fell soft as cotton curtains, then the thicker muscular rain, then the shining ropes of rain, then many streams bouncing up off the driveway, you know this rain, and then the pounding rain. Life is perfect, Ellen shouted. I yelled back, and we aren't even getting wet yet. It's like we're not even here, she said. And that was exactly my feeling too. So Florida, as you know, has been completely underwater many, many times in its, in its long life. And this is a poem on the miracle of training only some of that water to come inside the house on command. The title is Slab Weep. And if you don't know what that is, stay innocent. Slab Weep. In my kitchen... Kyle, the plumber, and I stand over the deep, jagged hole in my tile, looking through a concrete layer cake into white sands far below the slab of my house for a long time. With a plumber, every minute is a $3 minute. <laughs> you got a slab leak, he says, slowly turning. His thin silver ponytail pipes down his back to his waist, fitted with black elastics. Because my slab is weeping, he says, I should consider a repipe. It takes me about $10 to understand the word repipe. <laughs> Some words filter through not knowing, seeking low places. I'm all low places these days, and thus I sit down on my kitchen floor next to Kyle's feet, his boots, to reach my hand down into the depth, to touch the wounded, fragile copper line, cold and thin and terrible and alive, the central vein of my house, perforated. I work my fingers into the old ocean floor, considering that string of islands that used to run from Orlando all the way up to Tallahassee, where the sea lapped the shore of what's now the Leon County Fairgrounds. You can see it where the clay turns to sand there. When I pull my hand from the dust, it's bone dry. Why is this, Kyle? Well, Kyle says, plumbing is essentially a mystery. <laughs> But there's a leak somewhere. The meter spins like a top, as do I. When they put in all these houses, he says, they moved the river. No one's saying nothing, but ever since, major problems out here. Sinkholes, cracked foundations, seepage, the acidified copper turning to tissue. It's your money, he says, but we both know now it's really not. It's his money. <laughs> I lie down and press both arms down into the acrid mineral silt into the dry heart of Florida. What do you want me to do, he says. Nothing. Fill in the hole. Live your life. Move the river back. Fill in the hole. Live. So I'm, I'm going to do something I think I've never done before. Um, I'm going to read a brand new poem that nobody's really seen. Because of Kyle, mostly, I've been house-sitting a lot and living in hotels and, and house-sitting. So plumbing. This poem is titled House-Sitting. It's kind of a thank you note. House-sitting. Like going to the mall while not having a job, while not having a boyfriend, or parents, or children, or chores, or animal needs, or true plans for a future, or a history, or an aging body. You don't need anything when nothing is yours. Also free, as though walking in the forest at around age seven, when everything is from somewhere unknown and extremely interesting, and needs nothing from you, 
creature, leaf, cracked stone, alive, and you know there's time in every room in the world to understand all of it. And in this way, you're a little god. <laughs> Inside, where it's cool, no snakes, no thorns, no bills coming my way, or workmen, or leaks, or foundational issues of any kind, just window panes and clean, glide through other rooms, protector of mystery, and part of belonging, but not owning. Light and barefoot and wise and young, the super elusive sweet spot, house sitting, and their ice maker whispers, hush, rest, satin, and the tile shines without any of my scars or my damage, and on the countertop, by the complicated, possibly finished coffee maker, would not touch it, are directions for my dream life for Alice in Wonderland. Press once, hold for two, drink all of our whiskey, eat all of our food, call if you have questions. You will not ever be bothering us. I'll close with two teaching poems. Uh, teaching is my life. The students are the center of my life. I love them. I weep at the end of the semester at traffic lights while my colleagues are still running for the hills. I'm sitting in Cooper Hall, weeping and alone. Uh, this poem is titled Accidental Practitioners, and it's dedicated to my students, my poets, and their work. In Wednesday night's class, the introduction to form and technique of poetry. I'm teaching as though we're on a small raft. We are on a small raft. We may never see the ones we love again. Every poem is a message in a bottle. Revision is urgency with tweezers. How to pull out the bit not meant to be there. My brother died before midterm this term. I have a student in this class with his name. I call on this boy as often as I can. I say his name aloud to alter my relationship to grief. I see you have your hand up, Sean. I don't know if my brother ever read a poem in his life. I worry I'm selling poetry as salvation. And in this same class, I have a student with my moved out husband's name. Now the husband student doesn't ever raise his hand or speak. And in this same class, a student with my father's name, he sleeps in the back row. I do not call out his name. I do not want to wake him up. I do not put them in the same group. I spread them around. I watch myself closely, be very fair to the husband. <laughs> He's done nothing wrong. He got scared of what? Garden light and dying and death. Of what? The interior experience, not well lit. After the midterm, I imagine they'll be back to themselves at least a bit. The students will begin to manage their own independent identities. Already, things are settling, but my bite is not correct. I'm dubious about the last stanza. I walk in the evenings alone. I bought a linen dress with horizontal stripes he'd hate. I thought it would make me appear wider in the sense of unstoppable, but wearing stripes, I just feel like I am in jail. I read into late hours. I dread seeing him weave through town rooms with women, his looky look. But I know love, when simplified to its lowest common denominator, denominator, means sorrow tomorrow. I know it isn't too late to change. Tonight, I'm introducing the English sonnet as a method for containing anxiety and grief's pulse. We sit on the floor. We write by hand. 140 syllables. I call on my father. 
I call on my brother. We write the sonnets as letters to the ones we have lost. I've never lost anyone, my husband student says, out of the blue. You can lose me, I tell him. Pretend you will lose me. You met the poem form, The Villanelle, earlier tonight in Emily's wonderful reading. A Villanelle, for those of you who haven't taken the quiz in my class, is a poem that's written in tear sets, three line stanzas, and it's based on a dance. Um, this is the last poem I'll read tonight. And I'm, I'm sorry, y'all, but this is a poem for those of us who are never late, ever, <laughs> ever. And the sad part is, in our righteousness, we're so judgy for the ladies, you know? We judge, we judge to teach the Villanelle, to teach the Villanelle. I was driving down the highway, constantly maneuvering to be not too close through Florida breezes, winter bright and delicate. So many slow wavy fronds scraping the low bowl of the sky. And I was not late or trapped in my mind with tangled worries, was not on my phone or on anything except the Villanelle reciting an old odd one softly, working my way along runnels of cars, heading to campus to offer my brief lesson on the power of repetition as a method for holding grief. See how it slips away and never leaves. I had these measures of extra time because like a god, I'd given myself time. I was alone and the traffic was dense cans as often happens on the highway here, I heard my father's voice. Where are all these people going? Where the heck are they all going? I'm mystified. And that moment, in that moment, I was upon the stoppage as I saw the car in front of me slam to a stop. And this is when time stopped, or maybe it veered, or I did. Maybe it was the hit that jolted me out of the lane, the sensation of the roots frizzled and all my teeth flying out of my head. The sound of cars crashing into each other at speed, a sonic bomb, pavement jumped, and that too made me fly through, not glass, but something becoming never the same again as spinning cars slid past me sideways so fast. Ah, the villanelle, it will not get taught tonight. That was my one stray thought as somehow I stepped out of my car as though from a pumpkin. I spun in the sun. An officer said, calm down, calm down. But I wasn't there, it seemed, or visible to me. Calm down, lady, she shouted. She took my name, my license. Around us, the still bouquet of crumpled cars shining, steaming, and ambulances, three Great blinkered barges, slow pulsing up the median. The arrival of blue light. I padded my body parts as though to reassemble loose parts. I looked around on the ground for my head. Some of me is still there on the highway with bumper bits and shatters. And I know I'll never know what happened or how, I drove away that day and somehow arrived one minute before class <laughs> to teach tercets and rhymes as one way to reverence as lifeline stop time. Thank you. Oh, what a great reading. Thank you, Heather and Emily. Thank you so much. You guys were both amazing. Um, we are going to segue now into our Q&A. Um, and um, I'm hoping that some of you all will have um, some questions that you want to ask. And I have a few I can add to the mix. So um, yes, please. Hi, Jim. Nice to see you. Is 
Sure, I would think that, um, I, I think that both of those things are probably true for almost all poetry, right? I think that mortality is probably in there. Uh, I mean, we, we study what happens in our life and, and that is part of holding on to those things um, and also part of preparing what's next. And I think all of that is about uh, mortality. Uh, and, and I think that writing, uh, I think that writing specifically, of course, writing our own experiences uh, is, is therapeutic. Uh, you can't help from it being therapeutic. Uh, you were talking about teaching the sonnet as a way of, of uh, controlling grief, specifically, which I love and I'm, I'm stealing. Um, but it's, uh, it, I, so I, I think there, there's, that's always sort of out there is that um, if you, you, even if it's not your own experience, it's one that you somehow relate to. And so you, you write and it, it's, it, there's something in there that's going to feed you, mm. I hope. Um, Heather, would you like to add to that? Sure. No? Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. A follow up? Sure. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I meant Uh, okay, so yeah, I think that this recent, um, the, the way a wound becomes a scar, it, uh, there's, there's sort of two layers to it. Uh, I, I do think that there's some, a, a theme of maybe, uh, or there's a hope that there's some redemption there. Uh, in the book, there are poems that really address the uh, kidney transplant, uh, because it is complicated, and so, uh, you know, you're parsing a lot of things out. Um, there's also there was also a um, a, a breakup uh, shortly before that, and so I, and I think that it deals with the emotional wounds and the physical wounds, mm -hmm. and maybe searches for um, for the redemption of one through the other. Um, so mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I think that I think yes, I, a short answer. I, I did end up um, somewhere else. Um, I hope. I hope we all will after we read the book. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Good, thank you. Other questions from you all? Yes, please. Hi. My question is for Heather. Mm -hmm. So how do you slow down and clear your mind so much that you are with every raindrop? And maybe <laughs> some of us can do it once in a while, but you do it over and over again. How do you do that? I'll say thank you. Um, <laughs> there's that great Salvador Dali quote that I share with my students. And he says, you know, people look at the paintings. Are you on drugs? He says, I'm not on drugs. I am drugs. <laughs> <laughs> I think seriously, when you grow up, and we all have experienced trauma if you've survived childhood, when you grew up with enormous amount of trauma, you are so hypervigilant, right? You're really, really kind of called to pay attention. At the same time, I don't know, the anxiety maybe mediates against that. I'm not sure. Kate, you know I like to spend a lot of time alone. It's too much time alone. That's what <laughs> it is. Do you want to talk about yeah, but just poetry as an act of paying attention? Yeah, sure. I think that um, there are there's so many things that um, that happen that you may not realize happen in the moment. When you sit down to write, uh, you find those things. Sometimes you create those things because they needed to be there, uh, because they speak to sort of the bigger picture. So I, I think that the act of writing is one of investigation. It's mm -hmm. the writing itself that's mm -hmm. the paying attention. Yeah. And it mm -hmm. feels that way to me too. Yeah, not the moment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not the moment. <laughs> Good, yeah, yeah. Right here, please. Do you, do you sit down to write, or does it come to you? Yeah, because I love I that question. That, that I'll feel this urge to sit mm -hmm. down and write. But if I have to sit down and say, I'm going to write, this is my writing time, <laughs> then it probably wouldn't work. 
Yeah, I, I'm always so jealous that when I read about how Sylvia, Sylvia Plath would, you know, wake up at the crack of dawn, but way before the crack of dawn, and write for hours before her children woke up. <clears throat> uh, I, I don't, I don't understand it. I could never do it. I do have trouble <laughs> putting aside time, uh, and I'm much more productive when I have an idea, and then uh, I, I have the time when I have the idea to sit down and uh, and play with it. Uh, but, uh, but so I guess I'd say I'm terribly unorganized. But you have to make time some at some point so that so that the writing gets done. Uh, otherwise, otherwise it doesn't. Which which are you? Are you super organized? organized. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> super organized. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I'll kind of ask a question that kind of ties into this. I mean, you're both clearly terrific you know, professors, and I'm sure that your students are crazy about both of you. Um, you know, so, so it's Frost, right, who says that poems begin in delight and in, in wisdom. And I think other poets have sort of said the same thing, right? Um, but because both of you have so many metaphorical leaps in your poems, you have so much going on in your poems. Your poems go a lot of places. They clearly are not in the same place where you started. Can you talk a little bit about how you encourage your students um, to make sure when they get into the writing process to leave that present moment and make the poem somehow go deeper, um, maybe move vertically. Um, can you both talk a little bit about that um, if, in your own writing, but also as, as teachers? Well, I think one of the things poetry does is it, it says stop, to stop. Mm -hmm. No stopping, no poem. Mm -hmm. And then it asks us to pay attention to language and not use those prose moves, those narrative moves where the predictable thing would be said. So an exercise I did with my students, and they're here tonight recently, was I made them bring all their poems, and I gave them all scissors. I was house-sitting, so these weren't even my scissors. And <laughs> <laughs> I think we weren't supposed to do that with the pinky machines. But um, we cut, I made them cut all the lines up, and we put them in a big salad bowl, also borrowed, and stirred them all up. They hated everything about this. And then they drew lines, and they had 10 minutes, and they made poems, and they loved these poems because they were good. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question, how? Just make so sometimes poems. exercises to kind of put, yeah, interesting, yeah, Emily? Yeah, I mean, uh, of course I talk a lot about, you know, the, the two levels, you know, um, what's on the surface and what's beneath it. Um, so I, I think that, you know, I do point it out to them, but it, it probably gets through to them more when they have an activity and it just happens. Right? Yeah. They mm -hmm. might not even realize they're learning to do that. Uh, it's just organic, and I, I think that that's usually the magic sweet spot. Mm -hmm. for yeah. Well, and it's so important because, especially in um, narrative poems, um, you know, you can pack a lot into the development of that poem. There's a lot going on. Um, but I think sometimes the challenge can be how do you make sure that your poems are doing that vertical movement and trying to get more at the heart of what it is you're trying to say? Um, I find that a challenge in, in my own poems. But I, need, I see in both of your poems, um, your work, that you do it with these really wonderful metaphorical leaps. It's where those leaps are happening, that the poem goes from moving horizontally to moving vertically, um, and I'm getting that much closer to the heart of the poem. I think you both do that very well. Um, um, and yeah, exercises, I think, can sometimes get us there. Other questions? Yes, back here, please. Yeah, you said that you had an inside-out <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for your comments. I really appreciate what you said. Mm -hmm. There's that saying, and I think this came up in your poems too, you write, you write from your scars, not from your wounds. Mm -hmm. And then there's that great Mark Twain quote, there's no humor in heaven, but hell is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Other questions? Yes, please, here. Really, how 
Let me how you do this. You just have this flap and you just sit and it comes through you when you write. So you I, have this just keep going. And, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um so thank you, thank you for your kind words to both to both of us. Um, I am I am a short story writer. I I love poetry that's lyric and less narrative. But to read it out loud, I just feel like it can be, I don't know, I, it can be a tough sell. So I like mm -hmm. to have the audience be able to at least have a place to sit in the poem that's clear. So that's the mm -hmm. types of poems I read out loud would be different ones that you would read on the page. As I teach my students, you have to read the poem more than once. You haven't even started yet. Um, so those poems, there's poems for listening and there's poems for reading and rereading, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Good answer. Would you like to add to sure. that? Yeah, I, I think that um, this is another one of those uh, those things that people, I think, usually come down on one side or the other. If, if it just comes right the way that it is, or is it a tedious crafting and uh, I, I'm sure everyone for everyone it's both uh, at least at, at, you, you know at some point but but for me it's uh, it's it comes at once and the crafting comes later which is mm -hmm. a more direct answer maybe to the question than you wanted so again I have a question that is kind of tied to what you're saying because I think both of you correct me if I'm wrong both of you um, write nonfiction um, as well as poetry. And so I'm curious uh, if you could just talk a little bit about how you see those two genres um, intersecting and, and or diverging and how you, when you sit down to write about something, how do you necessarily know um, which way you're going to go, which genre you're going to go to that's right for that particular subject matter? Can you talk a little bit about that, both of you? Have, do you, uh, you said you write fiction too. So do you have... Uh, um, do you think that nonfiction is closer to poetry or fiction is closer to poetry? Like in your experience of writing? That's a great, I love this conversation. It's such a treat to talk about these things. Um, <laughs> so I see every poem as a love letter to the English language. It's a love letter mm -hmm. to language. So the poem is going to start with language, like little sticks and fire. Mm -hmm. It's going to be language, so there's going to be sound that's going to be cooking. So a story is going to, uh, it's going to start with a narrative impulse, mm -hmm. and it's going to have so many different kinds of questions. Um, so I, I think I usually know. I was going to use a pregnancy metaphor. I'm going to not do that. It's, I think <laughs> I usually know what I'm cooking. Mm -hmm. I'm going to stop. When that you set right out. There. Yeah, yeah. There. Okay. Uh, huh. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that um, when, I, when I write nonfiction or poetry, I write about the same things, generally, you know, something that I know about um, and something that, that I've experienced. Uh, so I, I don't think that I separate by topic, you know, what, which one I'm going to write about. I think that I probably cover it in both. And when there's something, you know, th sometimes there's something that does feel like it needs to be in prose. You need the space and you need mm -hmm. uh, the development um, that you're in control of throughout. Whereas with a poem, uh, I think we relinquish a little bit of control, which is why we use form and mm -hmm. uh, and make these careful language decisions is because you have that small space, so, so you have to, to do those things for the control. But, but ultimately, with prose, you get a little more control of the reader and the direction uh, mm -hmm. for those bigger subjects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, somebody, Jan, you haven't asked a question yet. The music, um, so just paying attention to the, the sound work tools that we have. I think that's the most fun part of writing mm -hmm. poetry is manipulating the sounds to create the kinds of just like a musician to create that movement and feeling in the reader that you're going for. I think it's the most rewarding thing to teach because it's teachable. Mm -hmm. It's hard to teach students subject matter and tone, mm -hmm. but you can teach them sound work. They can find those echoes and they can hear pretty easily, yeah, that's that's disastrous. Mm -hmm. Catastrophic <laughs> sound work. It's, it's, it's rewarding um, to teach. I think that there's, uh, after you, you know, there's a point in, in writing, uh, a point after a while where there's something that clicks and you know, you know what sounds you need or what's, when you find a sound, you know you have it and you know it's good. 
it's such a good feeling. Uh, and, and, it's, and I do think it's sort of an instinct that becomes honed. So I, uh, I, like, I don't know if I'd say sound's my favorite part of it. I'd, I'd say probably image, but, mm -hmm. but yeah, but they, but mm -hmm. they end up becoming one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. And I want to quote um, the wonderful Peter Mikey, our state poet laureate, um, from his textbook. Peter, I may not get it exactly right, but your wonderful textbook, The Meaning of Poems, um, where you suggest to poets that when we're revising our work, um, instead of going back and revising specifically for what the poem means or is saying, you suggest that we should go back and that you go back and revise for the sound of the poem. Um, and that you trust then that the sound and the images will carry the meaning of the poem. And that's that stuck with me um, ever since I had the good fortune to audit your classes years ago. Um, and that's in that wonderful textbook, yeah, that you, you gear your revision towards sound. Um, so I, I've always loved that, yeah. Um, yes, please. Absolutely. Um, it goes to Emily's point that when it gets too big, um, mm -hmm. it, it, it outgrows its poetry confines. It has to move. However, I think in our culture, we define the long poem as something that goes over two pages. But I think of Frost mm -hmm. and A.R. Emmons who wrote book-length mm -hmm. poems or Whitman. And so I, I, I like a long poem. Mm -hmm. In my most recent book, I, I like it. I mean, the publisher called it poetry, and I'm like, if you want to buy it, we'll call it poetry. <laughs> so, but it wasn't really exactly conceived as poetry. They're like micro essay, hybrid, short story prose poem things, but you right. can't talk like that, or people just run from the museum. <laughs> but I like long lines. I like thinking about the difference between a paragraph and a stanza. These things are interesting to me. Like, how much can a small group of lines hold. That was my project in field notes for the flood zone. So mm -hmm. I'm interested in when does it start breaking down in, as a poem and moving into a prose thing, but mm -hmm. can I hover in that that line? Yeah. Genre and gender share a root, and I like it that those definitions aren't so simple as we thought mm -hmm. they were. Good. So I'm kind of in, in those seams, if it makes sense. I love that, yeah. Emily, how about you with respect to that, that hybrid um, of both short essays and poetry? Yeah, well, I think uh, it leads into my, my nonfiction more, where I struggle to keep it from being too lyric, you know, if that's a thing. I, I think that, that for me, sitting down to write, I, and I write a lot of uh, flash nonfiction, so for, I think that you could package it often as something mm -hmm. that might be poetry. Yeah, and, absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, you if you're focused on things like those elements of sound and image, then it it it's there. I mean, the work is there in that nonfiction, then for it to also have have the poetry in it. And mm -hmm. and people use that phrase, right? That turn of phrase where oh, it's just poetry mm -hmm. um, because it's everywhere. Yep, it's in all of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's a wonderfully terrific um, thing to have that kind of hybrid. I think I don't think people run away from it at all. I think people embrace the idea of um, that crossover between the short lyrics, um, essays, and, and poetry. I love it. I mean, if you had said to me that that's what you were reading, I would have believed you. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, that was wonderful. Other, yes, right here, please. For both of you, um, do you ever write just for yourself without considering it being read or heard or listened to hmm. by others? Only by accident. Yeah, no, I, I think that there's there are a lot of things that I write and then think, oh, this is never going to be read or heard or listened to by others. But um, but I don't ever sit down and do that. I, I don't think I ever sit down and do that on purpose unless it's notes that will maybe feed into a, a, an essay or a poem or uh, a syllabus or something later. So uh, yeah, I don't think that I do it on, on I, I, other than notes. I don't think that I, I write um, I always hope that it's something that will have a, a universal uh, uh, connection, but can't, I guess 
I hope that we that's what you know we're all striving for is something that connects us. But, mm -hmm. yeah. How about you? Um, I write every day. I keep a day book. It's not a diary or a journal of feelings. It's a day book where I'm practicing, practicing. I also I I didn't mean to bring it, but I did. <laughs> but I keep a daily diary where I write down every day what I saw, what I heard, what I observed, and then a little drawing. There's a lot of coffee cups, wine glasses, and spectacles. <laughs> and it's, it's almost always coffee, wine, glasses. So I, I'm, I'm writing every day. I'm practicing every day, trying to stay in touch with that urge to utter and, and, the, and the sound of the language. Good. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, please. Uh, I'm intrigued by uh, Heather's comment when you said, I'm super organized. And I kind of, this kind of connects to what you're just talking because I had an impression through your poetry of your personality, how you speak, that you are actually a very free spirited person. <laughs> and also that the fact that you were, you know, raised outdoors with that freedom of nature and and then you're saying, Well, I'm super organized. And I, I wonder what what your thoughts on that. How why you need to be super organized when your sort of background and your personality seems so be <laughs> free and impressionistic. Well I I think as with children the more predictable, the tighter the square, the more uh, structure you have, the more free you can be. So when, a, when you've got a tight space to work in like a sonnet or four hour morning, um, you're gonna get this stuff done. Uh, it's, I think the constraints are what allow for the imagination. Okay, well thank you both so much and thank all of you for coming. And I hope that I hope that you'll go out and buy their books. Um, Heather and Emily are going to run to the table <laughs> so, so they can sign them for you. So again, thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay.